most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In this episode, we are going to have a conversation with Lauren C. Nelson. She is a speaker and founder of Partner for Impact, PFI, which helps improve inclusion and belonging in the workplace by using data, strategy, and training. Hi, Lauren. You know, I am so excited to have this conversation with you. You are a coach and speaker who is on a mission to change workplace dynamics. And I'm excited to, to know about you, what you have been doing, and the work of your company, Partner for Impact. So I'm just curious, you know, little George, curious little George, or what is the backstory that led you to discover your path? Absolutely. So first of all, Nagelia, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to be here. It is such an honor. And I appreciate this platform that you have to bring so many brilliant women together. Oh, but thank you. Absolutely. Um, but the background, what led me to start Partner for Impact? It's a really multi-layered story, but we can really start with my experience in the workplace. So if I can take you back to 2018. I'm 28 years old and I'm in the ER. Can I take you into the room with me? Yes. So I am in this cold, sterile emergency room. I'm laying on this hospital bed. I'm feeling embarrassed. My shirt is raised and the nurse is putting, you know, heart rate monitor things on my chest because they're trying to see if I had a heart attack or not at 28 years old. Wow. And yes, absolutely. And it turns out I didn't have a heart attack. It turns out that I had an anxiety attack. I was in an environment and the work that I was doing that was full of microaggressions, micro insults, you know, being in a male dominated space, being treated like I was small because I was a woman or a woman of color. And it just reached a head where I just couldn't take it anymore. And so that for me was just a key pivotal moment that says, I am not going to spend the best years of my life doing this right here. This is the last time that this ever happens to me. And so that was the decision that I made after leaving that hospital room that something had to change. And so I already had a small coaching practice where I was coaching other diverse professionals, but I decided that this has to evolve into something bigger. And that's where Partner for Impact came, where we were going to focus on transforming the work environment instead of just helping people to survive and go through their ER experiences and then go back to work the next day. Wow. Pretty much, you could have just lose your life. It's like, for me, I looked at it, it's kind of like a second chance. It's like, this is a wake up call to make something, to make a change in your life. So to, um, not only that, also that the change is not just for you, but also to open doors for other women or the other people that's in the same situation to not stay in that type of type of environment, because it's not good for you. Absolutely. And you know, Nagila, with the work that I do, I look at data all the time. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data geek. I love data. I love looking at the numbers. I love to understand the full perspective. What are the reasons that things happen and what was the effect? What is the impact of that? Hence, you know, partner for impact. But when we look at the numbers, women and people of color in the workplace, the experience that I had is not a common, it's not an uncommon experience. It's quite common, but people don't always talk about it but it's going on. Yeah, but I think that one of the reasons why they don't talk about it is the fact that one, it's like when you start talking about people usually say you're just complaining or you're just using your colors to manipulate anything else. And uh, not only that, who's really listening to you? Not too many, you know? And at the end, it's kind of like you find yourself in it and cope with in just in a little box with nothing else. And then if you're in a place where there's other women, you probably would have the type of woman that just want to 
keep going up so they're not gonna help you they just want to leave you down there in a box so it's kind of like it's hard it is it is hard and it was a challenging experience and one thing that i have commonly seen just and this is me speaking from my experience but i know other women that i have worked with and i have coached over the years have had the same experience so for me, I was a first generation university student, meaning like first in my family to go away to university, not be married, not have any kids and just do that whole college life experience. So my path was one that was different in my family structure. So when I was going through the experiences that I was going through, my family loved them. They were so well intentioned, but they would say things like, well, you got this great job. You're in your late 20s. You're making all this money. You get to travel the world. You'll be fine. You know, back in my day, fill in the blank, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a common experience, especially that women um, often, to ex often experience. Exactly. It's always like, even I heard it before, it's like, you have it better than I did. I didn't have that at all. I didn't have this at all. So sometimes you just feel like, okay, maybe I should just be quiet and stop complaining, you know? And I've been there. It's even to family. It's hard to talk with family sometimes because they just looked at you like, um, would you like me to tell you my life story? Um, no, I just want to tell mine so you can give me some advice. Um, so it's, it's, it's that I guess that's the reason why we need uh, to talk about this type of things to, for women to understand it's okay. And sometimes the best thing to do is to reach out to someone like yourself, like, uh, that can help them. Because just talking to your families, to friends about it, for them, you just blah, blah, blah. And they just like, okay, they move on with their life. They forget what you just said. But I think a professional can actually kind of guide you into the whole process to help you fix the problem instead of leaving it forever. Yes, absolutely. And I can't even emphasize this enough that for me, when I was going through that whole experience, that was one of the most lonely, loneliest experiences of my life. Until I got a coach. <laughs> Until I got a coach that I was able to talk about my problems and they were help, able to help me shift from a space of feeling powerless and disempowered to feeling powerful. The game is mine. I have the cards. I can do what I want to do. And this situation does not define me and it doesn't hold me back. That's a exactly. whole different approach and conversation than, well, you should just be lucky that you're in the position that you're in. A lot of people have it harder than you, and I'm sure they don't mean it, but that kind of toxic negativity, like it, it, it weighs you down. It can have a negative effect. Exactly. And then you just end up staying where you are because you're like, okay, I'm good where I am. My family says so. My friends say so. Everyone is happy with me. So I guess I should be happy. I'm just selfish. I don't want, I just want more, more, more because I'm selfish. But you know what? What would be a life if we're not a little bit have that little selfish into us to want more in life instead of being comfortable. And one thing that I realized as a teenager, the more comfortable I was in my space, I didn't want to do anything else. If I come, if I come from, uh, from school and home and I do my math and then even I hit math, I'll do it anyway so my mom doesn't scream at me and I, I can go in the couch and watch TV or do something else. Well, that's the life. I don't have to do anything else. I'm comfortable here. But once you get yourself out of that comfortable, you want more, that's what makes you a better person. For me, that's how I see it. And I think my son made me realize that when I have my, my, my son, it was kind of like, I want more in life. I want to be able to be better than my mom. I want to be better than this person. I want to be able to, to leave this behind for my son, even if he doesn't want it, but he can sell it and make create something for himself and for my grandchildren. So I look at all these different things. Maybe I'm a little too to not to think of all of the pictures, all of these things, but that's how I looked at them. And then um, for me, I feel like the next generation needs to be better and the next generation start with us making a difference right now. So what you are doing, I think it's special and we need to keep on doing it. And then we need to also keep on talking with one another. So that brings me to another question for you. So can you tell us about uh, Partner for Impact and the services that uh, you offer? Absolutely. So let's start with the name of Partner for Impact. So we call ourselves Partner for Impact. When you think about impact, impacts happen quick and fast. Mm -hmm. We're not those people that want to stay around forever. We want to get in. We want to help you make a difference. We want to create light and be lighthouses in dark and desolate work environments. And then we go. 
because we created the structure, we created that impact. So the light is there once we leave. So that is our goal and our mission. When we break it out into what we do, we do two things. Number one, we help businesses by becoming more diverse and inclusive and equitable. And then on the other hand, we help them by managing their conflict. You would be surprised how many organizations um, and just businesses in general have people, incredibly accomplished and talented people who are skilled at what they do, but they don't know how to manage conflict. They don't know how to handle the beef. They don't know how to handle the passive aggression. They don't know how to handle these things. And they tend to call us. So we come in and we help sort out the issues. Wow. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I like the fact that you don't stay. (laughs) I'm not here to stay. I'm here to just fix your issues, get you rolling, and next level. (laughs) Yeah, almost like Olivia Pope, if you remember the show Scandal. We're here to come in. We're here to get down to the quick. And that's part of our values. When I think about impact, we want to be in and out and we don't want to waste anyone's time. We don't want to waste our time. And we want to work with people who are ready to do the work. And so that's where the impact comes in. And so our services are boiled down into four different key pillar services. Number one is workshops. Again, like I said, I'm a data geek. I love data. Um, I'm also a certified uh, diversity trainer. So I love adult learning techniques, accelerated learning. Our workshops are some of the most popular and high in demand because we give adults a learning experience. We're not boring lecture hall type, you know, style of teaching. (laughs) Right, exactly. I'm talking to you. I'm looking into the eyes of everyone, whether it's in the virtual space or it's in person. Every It's a workshop. People are doing work and they love it because there's a saying that if I say it, I own it. If you say it, you own it. And so we pull the employees into the work. And so it's not just managers and leaders and these outside people who are doing the work. No, I want everybody at the table. Let's get our hands dirty. Let's get to work because you get the privilege of co-creating the ex- work experience that you want. So that's number one, what we do with our workshops. Number two is assessments. We do organizational assessments and I highly, highly, highly recommend that every female entrepreneur under the sound of my voice that's listening to this right now, you need to be assessing your organization for inclusion and diversity on an annual basis. And here's why. Um, Think about a workplace assessment or diagnostic like your car. When I was in college, my car was a struggle because I didn't really do the maintenance on it like I should. Okay. I'm talking about the oil changes, getting the tires balanced and rotated. I don't know how that thing lasted as long as it did but it lasted, but I'm not not recommending that. But how do you know when something is wrong with your car? You see it, you hear something's going on, the steering wheel starts to rattle, something is moving like it shouldn't. That's when you know that something is off. You don't wait until your car is on the side of the road before you go get help. And assessments are meant to be a preventative measure. So you go and find out what's happening in your organization on a regular basis and you take action on those things. Don't wait until the crap hits the fan before you call the plumber. And that will be us. (laughs) I like that one. I like that one. (laughs) Oh, good. I'm glad you like it. So that's number two. So workshops, assessments. Number three is consultation. Pretty straightforward and simple. You need help thinking through your strategy. You need help thinking about how do we go about this? How do we deal with this? You know, we want need help forecasting what diversity and inclusion is going to look like for us in the future. We can help with that um, and picking our brain, those sorts of things. And then lastly, number four is executive and uh, people manager coaching. So we have an extended network of coaches that we work with, um, myself included, who are all um, professionally trained, credentialed, diverse coaches that are experienced that can provide support to a diverse group of managers, leaders, professionals, um, and people managers in the workplace. Wow. But you also talk about uh, BEI. Can you tell us what's that about? 
Absolutely. So BEI stands for Belonging, Empowerment, and Inclusion. And so the BEI approach is our unique approach to organizational conflict. So I've been doing this work a number of years. And like I said, companies have trusted me to come into their organization to help them resolve their conflict. So this is when the horns have already locked. People are already huffing and puffing with each other. The silent treatments and stuff has set in. And now it's starting to impact the work. When I come into the space and I have um, sat down and I've talked to everyone and we've really sorted out the issues, it really boils down to three things. A lot of the times, people are not feeling like they belong or they're being treated like they don't belong in an environment. They're feeling like they're disempowered, that they have no power or agency over their career, over what happens to them next month, whether they're going to get fired. And they feel like they're excluded, like this place wasn't meant for me. So I'm not going to do any more than I need to do. I don't, not sure if you heard of the term quiet quitting, but it's a new name for the old employee disengagement. So even the new generation of people on TikTok, they're talking about quiet quitting. Why am I going to give? Yeah. Why am I going to give all of my time and my best energy to an employer that doesn't really care about me? I don't really belong. So I'm just going to fly under the radar and I'm going to quietly quit and not give it the best. Now that's the employee perspective. Now, when we look at it from we're entrepreneurs here, we've got businesses, we've got, you know, revenue goals and things that we need to think about. When you think about that happening on your team, that's missed out innovation. That's missed out productivity. Red, red alarms should be going off when you hear this thing, this phenomenon happen. But you would be surprised that a lot of organizations do not focus on that. And that's because if I, Nikhilia, I know that you have a background or experience with psychology. If you yes. think about um, the hierarchy of needs, every human at the base has a need for uh, survival, have a need for food, shelter, water, and employment is the next step. But the stuff that's at the top, self-actualization, harmony, all of that stuff, it's considered a luxury. It's the same thing in business. Business has got to keep the lights on. We got bills to play. We got to make payroll. We got to do this. We got to do that. Businesses are constantly in a survival state. That's true. And they, and they think that, oh, well, making sure our employees feel like they belong, making sure our employees feel like they're included, making sure our employees feel like they're empowered. That's just a luxury. We'll get there when we get there. Friends, I'm here to tell you that you're always going to have to worry about that bottom line. If you want to make sure that your business is thriving and not just surviving, you have to focus to it because that's how you get people to care about the business like you do. Wow. And that's the reason why you thought BI is one of your focus with your clients. Absolutely. So we trademarked um, BEI, the BEI, or I like to call it the Beehive Method, Queen Bee, <laughs> the, beehive, the Beehive Method. But if you think about how bees work, bees work as a team. They bridge gaps for each other. Again, I'm also, I love National Geographic, Discovery Channel. Like I love all of that stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> I do. I'm telling you, I was a nerd in school. I love, I love learning. But when you think of, you look at bees, how they work together, they bridge gaps and they're able to help each other within the hive. So mm-hmm. that way they can produce the honey and do all of the things that they need to do. It's incredibly interesting. I'm not going to give it all away, but this is what we do in our work is really un, you know, get employers to get into the mindset of if you want your organization to function as a well-run hive, these are the things that you need to do. BEI. BEI. Wow. <laughs> that is fascinating. I love it. So what is the difference between uh, BEI and BEI? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, BEI, the way I look at it, it focuses on the human experience. Everybody wants to feel like they belong, no matter what they look like, where they come from. At a very human level, we all want to feel like we belong. We want to feel like we're empowered. We want to feel like we're included, like we're a part of something, right? And so that is a key focus of it. And it's universal and it speaks to everyone. When I'm in organizations and I take the BEI approach, I find that people, 
here's the, can I be real, Nagelia? Go ahead, can please. I be, real? be my guest, I, yes. I promised you that we were going to have hot conversation, which is honest, open, and transparent. So I'm here to keep it hot and open <laughs> and honest. So what I've seen is the unfortunate reality of DEI work is that it has unfortunately been distorted and now has a cloud of woke over it. And although that the work is intended to make sure that we have diverse, you know, um, people, groups, ideas in the workplace, and that we're making sure that people have access and fair opportunities, it has been so politicized and so um, distorted in a way that you often fight to try to get the work done before you even start the work. So we still do things we still do diversity, equity, inclusion, all of that, but we do it with the flagship of BEI, belonging, empowerment, and inclusion. So you, it's, it, would you say that it's more like an easy way to get to make people feel more welcome, more com- comfortable, more um, belong to something compared to DEI? Um, no, I, so I would say that we use it as a methodology to be able to get to lower the defenses. Gotcha. DEI lowers the defenses because everybody can relate with wanting to feel like they belong. Everybody can relate with wanting to feel like they have empowerment. So we really drill down into what does empowerment look like? from the standpoint of an employee. What does empowerment look like from all of these different vantage points? But when we, you know, us as women of color, black women, we're talking with each other, what does empowerment, what does, would it look like for me to be able to feel like I belong and be included in this environment? We're having a conversation, but same conversation, just in a different way. And I find that the reframing of the conversation has been so powerful that I've been able, my team and I have been able to take some of the most resistant people and get them in the space of talking openly about the same things that we would talk about under DEI, but just in a different framework. Wow. <laughs> so it's a whole, a whole lot different uh, way of getting people to say, okay, you, you tr- I can trust you. Let me go ahead and talk to you about what's going on. Be more open. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, the question I was going to ask you, do you work with uh, corporations and small businesses or is just your focus is just in one? No, so we work with both. So we've worked with small businesses um, and we've worked with larger businesses as well. So most of the people who come to us, it's like a half and half. So we get the smaller businesses and then we get the big folks that work with us. Um, We've been contacted by Michelin five-star restaurants before. Um, I had no idea that there was so much drama in the restaurant industry, but apparently that there (laughs) is. So we've been in this interesting space of working with, you know, really high-end restaurants, helping them to deal with the issues on their staff or within partnerships. That's also another thing that we commonly get requests for is, helping people to come in, help have us come in to help them with their partnerships. So when would you say, I, I'm, a, I'm a business owner, so either it's mm-hmm. big or small, when do you think that I should call you to step in? So you can call me to step in at any time. And here's why. Like I said, if you think about your organization, the maintenance of your organization and the maintenance of your staff as a vehicle, There's a lot of space between your car thriving and being okay, and then it actually being crumpled on the side of the street. So you need to be coming in, you need gas regularly. And even if it's just a preventative measure, just saying, hey, we want to know where we stand, what, what is going on within our organization? I say, great, I think you should do an assessment. That way you can get a holistic, objective, perspective of what's happening within your organization. And here are some things that you could do using this as a strategy, finding out who's at risk, what are the specific departments or, or locations within your business that have the most, is, uh, the most uh, issues 
And how can you address those things strategically over the next six months to 12 months or the next 24 months? So that way you can make sure that your team is still operating well. So let's say that, um, well, I decided to take my car to you and then um, you realize that I need oil change and that's change. And then you give me a, a certain amount of mileage that I need to, I can drive the car or certain times. And then uh, what happened when I reach that mileage? Do I come back to, for another oil change or do I just keep on forget about the oil change, just keep on driving the car? So our, that's a great analogy. I love that you're walking through this car analogy with me. Um, but the idea is, is that again, we're the type of consultants where we don't want you to need us forever. So we don't just come in and say, okay, well, we just fixed this with your car. We'll see you later. We say, this is what the issues were. This is what happened. And this was what caused the issues. And here's also solution toolkit, knowledge, ed education. We want to load you with enough information on the front end, side end, back end. We want to put some extra treats in your trunk so you can drive away and be happy. So you know how to better maintain your vehicle, how to better maintain your staff, how to better maintain your organization. And so you can know when, before the engine light comes on, before there's beef, before there's issues, you know, before, uh, People are throwing blows before a noose is put in someone's locker. Hello, Amazon. You know, before that happens, you will have some, you, some parameters. You'll have an understanding of what happens before you get to that point. To get to that point. But you never meet uh, 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 business owners that's kind of like, I'm, I apologize, but I need your help back. Can you come in back again? Because I'm, I think so I'm running out of hand and then uh, we need your support back to get things again to place? Absolutely. So we never just cut off our clients. We have an ongoing relationship. And so that's part of our model. We want to maintain a relationship, but we don't want to stick around longer than we need to. And we don't want you to become dependent on us. So that's also a part of our philosophy, how we do workshops and training is that we want to step back so you can step in and you can have the confidence to be able to lead and to exercise this new learning. And of course, we'll be in the background coaching you along the way, supporting along the way. But the idea is for you to uh, no longer need us. We're always around, but you shouldn't need us every time. <laughs> you should be able to go take care of your own car. <laughs> if, we've done our job well. if we've done our job well. So your mission is a social change and organizational evolution. How do you intend to bring those about? Oh, that's a beautiful question. So, Nagila, I firmly believe in the power of individuals and the impact that they can have. So, if one person can cause pain and devastation to a thousand people, one person can positively bring hope, empowerment, inspiration to a million people. That's what I believe. So I go into work environments and I collaborate with teams, other collaborators who can rally behind that same belief. And so we right. bring that into the work environments that we go in. And like I said earlier, we're in the business of being lighthouses in dark and desolate work environments. So we come in and we set up shop. We're setting up lights everywhere. We're casting light on the hidden talent in the organization. We're finding out where all the trolls are hiding. We're weeding it out. And we're ultimately trying to transform the work environment. And I believe that it starts with one thing at a time. When we do workshops and having adults, grown men even, we're talking about our values, talking about the things that trigger us, hearing them say, I never knew this about myself. Oh. Or hearing people say, I didn't realize that I had this much power or this much say so ever in my life. And they're 45, 55. Wow. And so the work that we do is meant to be deep. It's meant to be impactful. We're not just coming in and talking about stuff on the surface. We teach things and we want people to say, they're talking to me. <laughs> Because I am, we're talking to everybody in the organization. Everybody plays a role. 
from the custodian all the way to the board member at the top and everything in between. So we, I strongly believe in social change and that's what we're starting with in the organization by bringing light. So another thing that I like is your vision, belonging, empowerment, and inclusion. So how do you incorporate this vision into your mode of operation? Yeah, so that's a really wonderful question. So again, that's how we lead our work. We focus on DEI, belonging, empowerment, and inclusion. And so at every step of the way, this is what it looks like, for instance. We say to leaders and managers, because we get pushback sometimes, oh, well, we're really inclusive here. Everybody feels like we belong. You know, we're not, you know, horrible. You get paid time off. It could be worse. Yes, it could be worse. But what would it look like for this particular group of people to feel like they belong? Or what would it look like for you to belong? What do you need to feel like you're empowered, like you have agency and that you have some control over what happens in your career. What does that look like? So we ask leaders that questions, but we also ask that for individuals. So I would ask you, Nikila, what do you need as a woman from where you sit, given your background, what do you need to feel included in this professional work environment? And we go there and we have those conversations and we get people in the room to hear what is important to other people. And the revelation is this, inclusion, belonging, and empowerment looks different for everybody. It's not the same. I can give you some real data for a second. This is real data from a client I worked with in the past. So we did an assessment and based on the data, we were able to see that for minority Black, um, you know, Latinx um, employees within the organization, for them feeling included was having a safe space to say, okay, I'm in an organization where we're actually talking about diversity. We're talking about microaggressions. We're talking about what's not okay, the things that have been hurting me. Now I feel seen, valued. I feel like I'm included in this environment versus another group. For them, feeling included is actually having access to promotional opportunities, having a pathway for promotion. That was real data. And why is that? Because they already feel like they're included. They're a part of the majority within the organization. They already speak the same language, probably have the same ancestral background, genetic DNA in a certain way. They probably are the same religion. They don't have those cultural and identifying blockers that are in the way. Right. So that you see two different experiences of what inclusion um, and belonging and empowerment could look like in the workplace. Wow. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you pretty much get to see the difference between them all. And, but how do, you, how do you create that space to make them all of them still together belong to one another? Like as a group, as, as, uh, as a group of people that's trying to build a company. Absolutely. So that's actually a really brilliant question. And so not one that we get often, but I'm so glad that you asked it here on this platform. So the way that I think about it, you can see some organizations that are doing it exceptionally well. And then we see some organizations that are not doing quite so hot in that area. But when you look at the flagship organizations that are really, really doing it well, they have a banner of unity and cohesion that's tying everyone together. They have, you know, they've embedded it within their organizational values, in their policies, in the structure, in the training of the managers. It's built into performance, which says that here at this organization, we value and honor everybody, not just some of us, but they say it, it's put in the policies, it's put in the rules. So you, if you want to work here, you got to follow these rules. This is what we believe. This is what we value. And then actually following up and enforcing it. It seems really simple, but for organizations, some organizations, it's really difficult for them to be able to get to that point. But those are the organizations that are doing it really, really well when they're able to have that banner of cohesion 
where we say that this in this ecosystem, these are our rules. People are valued here. We uplift everybody. Every, everyone's opinion and identity is welcome. And then the, when they don't have that together, that's when they actually need someone like you to come in and put that together in place so that employees can follow that. Correct. I can say you are a very busy woman. <laughs> that's a lot of work. <laughs> a small thing, but it's a lot of work, you know? So people would say, oh, you're just doing that. It's not much, but it's meant a lot to a lot of people. So it's a lot of work. Yeah. It is, but it's highly rewarding. It's highly rewarding. And being able to impact people and have people say, whether it's in person or virtually, or have it, they, you know, saying it in, you know, in an anonymous form of somehow being able to say that this really made me feel like I was seen. This made me feel like I was heard. I've never experienced anything like this. I've been waiting 20 years to experience this level of safety in the workplace. That is the value, and that's why we do it. And it's coming from experience as well, because you went through it and you know what can be changed to make a difference in people, especially women with color. So it's a lot. Not only we have to deal with being a woman, which is only a problem, and then you show up, they're like, oh, and she's black. Well, that's the second problem here. (laughs) So I know because I'm a black woman, so I've been through it. It's like, oh, we're hiring the new girl. Oh, yeah, it's a new girl. Okay, she'll be fine. Oh, crap, the new girl is black. Well, that's another problem. (laughs) And I've had that. Listen, I have have had those experiences. My friends have had those experiences. Or it could be the opposite if, you know, she's a white woman and it's a predominantly male environment. Oh, well, it's a woman. Oh, great. Now everybody, now here comes the me too. We're going to have to, you know, tighten up. We're going to get reported, you know, and they're just new, new on the team. So those are experiences that resonate. Yes. And having someone coming in to, to help them, I think it's important. Uh, I'm not saying just for women, uh, for the company in general. I think that. Mm-hmm. We deserve, I feel like we deserve better as women. Uh, I'm not saying that a company should make it like women are special, we should treat them like queen. I'm not saying that. I think that we deserve to be treated equally, where we feel like we are belong. And when we do our work, we get credit for it, just like everyone else. Um, I think that all these things is important. And, and I know it's a, it's a corporation, it, it's a uh, medium, it's a s- small business. I think it's important to make the woman feel welcome. And then you give them credit for what they do because we do a lot and it's a lot we do a lot behind the scene that other people take credit for and i think it's unfair in my point of view absolutely i agree with you 100 percent. so starting a business is challenging because i know i went through it a few times and woman was one of my number one challenge especially that i pick a very difficult market working with women um it's a blessing i love it and i love talking with to, to other women i love supporting women but um what was the issues that you face is when starting your own business? Ooh, that that's a loaded question. Do we have time for all of that? I'm not sure, but I have a, a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So for the, me, one of the main challenges was just navigating, just knowing how. I am a big wanting to know how person. I want to know what is the process? How do I do this? So I had this big, beautiful vision that I wanted to execute, but I didn't have the know-how. So before I would run into that lack of knowing, that knowledge gap, and I would let that stop me. But I was so hungry and passionate to fill that gap. I was reading books, watching videos. I was doing informational interviews with other business women, other men that were in business. And what was key and crucial for me was filling that knowledge gap. What I didn't know, I wasn't going to allow that to stop me. It's like, you want this for the long run and I'm going to just fight and whatever come along the way, it's going to be war because I'm not quitting. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. For me, it was, you know, you talked about your son. I don't have children yet, but this is part of the reason why I'm 
I started my business is that for me, I want to be able to have a family, but I also want to be able to have freedom and flexibility and asking somebody to, if my kid is sick, if I can stay home, I'm not asking you anything. I want to be there to take care of my children. And so for me, that was one of the key drivers of going hard as I did for this business. For me, it was all or nothing. I'm going to do this and there's no other plan B. Exactly. So I think that being a mom and be able to be there for your children is important. For me, that was one of my number one. I want to be there. I want to, every little moment, I want to be there because it's only going to happen once in a lifetime. And I'm not going to see that moment again. And I didn't want to miss them. And I I was grateful that God uh, gave me that privilege, but I can't take credit for all of it because starting woman, I had, I had a lot of great women that support me out of the along the way until today that's still supporting Womel. So I didn't do it alone. So I'm grateful that I meet them and uh, I'm in the circle as well to continue to support me. And I think that's um, important uh, to what you are doing is um, be able to be in the circle of other women that can, you know, when you you have that moment, we all have that moment where you just want to stay in bed with the pillow and like, I'm like, get out because I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know what to do. We, We all have that moment. (laughs) and that is so true and you know if i were to do it all over again i that's 100 percent one thing that i wish i would have done a lot sooner which is finding women entrepreneur groups um wish i had found this space much much sooner and being able to plug into you know groups and outlets with women who have done it who've gone through it all and so for me I had a bit of that mentality, again, being a family trailblazer, like I got to figure this out on my own type of thing. But having very key supports and mentors around me that says, I see something great in you. If you ever need anything, you can ask me anything. And that was all, you know, just absolutely phenomenal and helped me on my journey. Absolutely. I can see it. (laughs) So um, (laughs) what would you, if you have a chance right now, so I'm going to put you on this spot here. So let's say that um, I'm giving you a chance to support another woman. What would you give that woman right now, today? Listen, I, what I would tell another woman is that you have so much power. You have so much value and purpose inside of you than you even realize. I would say to any woman under the sound of my voice that raise your expectations, raise your standards for yourself, because you can do so much more than you think that you're capable of. And so for me, talking to another woman, especially if she's feeling down, is feeling, you know, having all of these thoughts of imposter syndrome, I want to reach in, pull that great woman I see in her out and raise it up. Because listen, I firmly, firmly believe this. The women, the woman that we dream of being, she doesn't show up until we do. I'm going to say that again. The woman that we dream of being does not show up until we do. So we have to tap into the psyche of the woman that we dream of being. You need to know what she thinks, how she moves, how she dresses, how she acts. How would she show up in this disempowering environment right now? How would she, how would my highest self show up and crush this right now? That's my gift. Find out what that is in you and then ride that wheel until it falls off, baby. That's what I would say. (laughs) (laughs) But also, I know that you wanted to give something away. Um, Absolutely. Go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. So absolutely. We do have a free resource. So we have an operationalizing DEI uh, roadmap. So oftentimes what we get from people is what is DEI about? What is this? What is this language? What does the process look like? So we created a free resource that we would love to give away to all of the audience members here. So if you're interested, we would love to empower you with this new information. So you can claim that uh, resource if you text roadmap, that's all one one word, road, R-O-A-D, map, M-A-P, 
you can text it to 771-444-5407. So you could get that free resource and we'll have it sent over to you. And we could also use that to stay connected as well. But we would love to give you that resource to get you on your way and give you something that you can start using today. Share it with your manager, share it with your team. And if you have any questions, you have my information at the bottom of the video. You're welcome to reach out to me. Absolutely. And one last question before I let you go. How can someone get help, your, get your services? Absolutely. So this is a great way that you can connect with me. So you can find me on LinkedIn. You're welcome to send me a DM on that platform. Or you can send an, a message to um, Lauren, that's L-A-U-R-E-N, um, at yourimpactpartner.com. And you can also see it down below in the bio as well. So you can send an email to there. We can find time to connect with each other, get some time on the phone. Tell me what your issues are. I would be happy to support you, give you some thoughts and ideas, some quick tips that you can apply right away so you can start experiencing value. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lauren. I appreciate you giving me the time to have this conversation with you, but also you sharing your knowledge with other women. and. Uh... Supporting women is something that close to my heart. Even sometimes it can be a little difficult, but the, one, the other women that you mean that just would just touch you, you cannot just say no not to support women. It's just like, you know, when you have those little kids that when you just meet them, it's like, ah, some women <laughs> you meet them is the same way, you know? So um, that's the reason why that mission of supporting other women is important to me. And I think that's one of the things I will continue to do until God take me away from this world. And I thank you for doing the same thing too, because I appreciate when I see other women supporting other women. Absolutely. You are a trailblazer. You are fantastic for creating this space and opportunity. And you are going to leave a legacy that lives on. So thank you so much for putting all of this together so that we're able to connect. And it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be with you today, Nagila. <laughs> thank you. What a great conversation with Lauren, a global coach on a mission to transform the workplace and help people create a space that brings out the best, most authentic selves to the table. Every employee or employer can appreciate her work to bring change. Thank you, Lauren, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Let me know your thoughts about this episode with Lauren. And to learn more about Lauren and Partner for Impact, visit www.partnerforimpact.com. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmail.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.